Hello, No Budgeters, and welcome to another episode of No Budget. I'm delighted to have uh, Vincent Lamb on the No Budget program tonight. He uh, was nominated for an Oscar as a writer-director for Detainment in 2018, and was recently nominated for IFTA. Uh, joining me as well is Carl Feeney, my lovely co-host. Uh, Milo's on holidays, so he sends his regards. Uh, thank you so much, Vincent, for uh, joining us here tonight. We really appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. Nice to <laughs> nice to see you guys again. Yeah. Hi, Claire. Hi, Cahill. Yeah. <laughs> so, how well. did you spend quarantine? Were you in Los Angeles or did you uh, in Ireland? Or? No, I, I wasn't. I was I was in Dublin, and um, I'm kind of set up in Dublin at this stage. Like now, uh, and I got I got to Westport for uh, a week of it, which was lovely. And uh, you know, I normally kind of turn my nose up at a Irish summer holiday, but it was, you know, after a lockdown, anywhere that wasn't uh, Dublin was, was just amazing. You know, I jumped at the chance. I was like, brilliant. So it was lovely. Yeah, we were staying on, on Clue Bay and, and had a really lovely time there. Yeah. That's brilliant. And, and it's interesting because actually we met back, I think it was 2017 we met uh, back in the Galway Film Fla. And I go, I'm from County Galway, so I go every year and I booked all my tickets. My friend Savannah, you know, very well as yeah, well. Of course, right. Um, yeah, yeah. I remember so, uh, there, yeah. It, it was so brilliant because we were sitting there and uh, before uh, the screening, the, 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 the person who's introducing the shorts were saying, uh, oh, you'll have to talk to these two little boys afterwards. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, you know? So I sat down and watched the yeah. short. And when detainment came on, I think there was silence in, in the room. And I was so blown away by it. Like it had a massive impact on me. And I went back to Dublin and I talked to Cahill and Milo and No Budget. And I was saying, oh my God, right. this film is amazing. And it was so lovely to talk to you afterwards. And Sylvana knows that you're a producer as well. She works with him before. And I know Tara, one of the actors in it. And it was right. just, it was just, I was so blown away by it. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, it was, it was a nice screen. It was nice to have the, oh. the boys with us and, and some of the, the, the other, the cast and crew and everything. So, uh, it yeah, was, it, was, it was great. I think it was, it was like one of the, the first kind of major Irish screenings of, of the film as, as well. I think, I, think, I think it was the Irish premiere actually yeah, in Galway. And it's, uh, it's an amazing place to have a premiere, isn't it? It's, it's uh, especially because it's Galway. Oh, and it was a pity because this year they had it all online, you know, so I was watching it all online. So I was yeah. pretty to be there, but I just I remember just being there at that time. And yeah, it, it was, yeah, really blew me away. And it was lovely to follow you on that journey as you led up to the Oscars. Wow, so I was right. like, I know that guy, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, there's always a great buzz about the town in, in oh. Galway. Um, and, you know, just kind of people you meet and, and everything. And, and it's, it's, yeah, there, there's something really special, I think, about, you know, being able to, show your film somewhere for the first time and and then get to talk to people afterwards and, and having the boys there uh, w was also just you know a really great experience oh, it's so I think it's, yeah, it's sad now that that festivals can't do that you kind of miss the networking element of it uh, but you know I, I think the Galway Film Club did a, a really great job like with with the pandemic on this year I, I think I think you know they they did a brilliant job but it's it's just hard, you know. I, I feel sorry for anybody who, um, who has a short film that they're submitting to festivals this year. It's so it's so hard. Like you know, the atmosphere has changed. But take us back to the beginning. So how did all this come about? Um, you mean like what? Yeah. what <laughs> how did yeah, the pandemic? Um, how did the <laughs> pandemic come about? So, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. How did detain? How um, did you, um, I mean, with detainment, I it was a story that had been in my head for a, a long, long time, um, and um, I, you know, I, I would have heard about it, you know, way back in 1993 when I was 12 initially, um, but then you know, as I grew up, I, I kind of my opinion kind of changed and, and I started kind of looking into the case because I, I think initially I was told that though those two boys were were simply evil and and, and that's why they had done it and, and and that was the popular opinion at the time and you know 26 years later now it's still the popular opinion um, that they were you know simply evil and anybody who gives an alternate um, reason as to why they, they did this or, or anyone who tries to understand why they did it uh, seems to get attacked or, or criticized for being overly sympathetic to the boys. Um, and, and as a result now, it's just kind of stifled debate on the whole thing, where 
it's 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 hard to have a conversation that doesn't turn into an argument unless you're saying you know they were evil and that's why they did it. Uh, but I think if you if you just dismiss children as being evil, it, it's very likely that something similar like this will happen again in the future. I, th I think the only way you can um, prevent something similar happening is is to understand the cause of it. So I, I think that was one of the reasons, like one of the main reasons why I wanted to make it from that point of view, where I thought it was a valid contribution to the discussion of, of, of that case and, and also of why children commit serious crimes. So, so um, what, 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 no, no, I mean, no, no, I mean, I, I think there was, there, was, there was a few reasons I wanted to make it, but, but that, that was definitely one of them. And, and, and the one thing that, that, that I always kind of had in my head, but I mean, it was, it was like a long time in the making, like, and I, I think it was maybe six years previous, like to, to when we, we, we finished it, when I, I had started, you know, looking at it as, at the possibility of maybe doing something on that. Um, so it, it was something I, I was kind of aware of for a long time, uh, but I talked to other people about it and, and I find it very hard to, um, to explain to them or, or to get them to look at that case any other way. Um, so I think that's why it was just something that stayed in, in my head for, for a long time. And um, yeah, it was, it, it was something that I, I, I just kind of kept coming back to, I think. But the performances of the, the two young actors is Eli Solan and Leon Hughes. And I know Eli, he's, he's Eli, in something yeah. um, with, um, I think he was in, um, uh, a series on Now TV, Sky series recently, and he's using it, it oh, was um, that's right, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, was it? Um, is um, it that? Yeah, he's he's been doing um, lots of lots of he, I think he's done is it like 11 productions or something since then? He, he's done a whole bunch of them. He was in, uh, he played a young Charles Dickens in The Man Who Invented Christmas with uh, um, Dan Stevens and Jonathan Price. And then he was in um, Dave Allen at Peace with Aidan Gillen. He played like a young uh, Dave Allen. Um, he's, yeah, so Four Kids and It was the latest one with Russell Brand. Um, but yeah, he's, he's, he's doing really great. And, and he won this um, big award just recently. Um, it's a Young Artist Academy Award in, in Hollywood. And um, it's, it's this huge award that, that has been given to uh, like like outstanding child actors over generations, like Leonardo DiCaprio won one, Jodie Foster, uh, Jacob Tremblay from Room, um, uh, Jamie Bell from Billy Elliot, and just goes on and on and on. So it's 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 great to uh, to see you like you know doing so well and and to be kind of joining the ranks of all these um, you know amazing um, child actors. You told me um, you told me uh, a story about the audition process. I don't know if you want to relate that. All oh, right. Yeah, I mean, when we were when we were casting for it, so I think like like a part of the reason I I also wanted to make this film was was because I, I I worked in casting and as an agent for actors, so I was I was always aware that um, child actors in particular that they were more capable of that they were capable of doing a lot more than what was being written for them. So when this one came along, I I kind of thought this this would be a, a great thing to kind of you know get to incredible child actors to, to work on. Um, so the, the way we did the casting, it's the same way I, I would sort of do it like for, for anything really. Um, I, I used to always find that child, you know, kids would come in and they'd be very um, prepared, like over prepared with their drama school teacher or their agents. They'll have done the scene, you know, 20 or 30 times. So regardless what you say to them, you're, you're going to get a similar delivery, I think. So now if I'm doing auditions, I, I just like to get them off the script immediately. And, and that's what we did then for, for the, for, for detainment. So we'd give them like one scene to prepare. So it might be the John and the detective scene. And I had an actor in the room who was reading with them. So I told him to just start improvising after the scene. And, um, and I said to do it differently to how the detectives would normally do it because they normally they're, they're quite gentle when they're talking to the boys but just for the purpose of the casting I, I told them just kind of you know lose the rag with them a bit and um, you know scare the living daylights out of them and I said let's see what happens 
so the, the great thing with that was that it, um, I think it, it, it always got the boys by surprise and, and suddenly they, they weren't acting anymore. And we got to just see how they would naturally respond in, in a situation. Um, it didn't matter about lines or, or, or anything. So, so um, like the actor reading would say something like, um, well, I think you're the liar. I think you're the liar. I think Rob is telling the truth and I think you're the liar. And, and it would get more and more intense. Um, and then we'd find that some boys, if you shout at them, they'll shout back. And, and then you think, well, right, maybe they're more of a Robert. Um, in Eli's case, he came in, he, um, he, he hadn't been doing drama. This was his first audition. Um, so I, I don't think we were expecting, you know, anything spectacular. He, he, did, he did a very good reading, um, but it was, it was his improvisation that just blew us away. Um, he's, he's just this boy who is like extraordinary way of, of um, getting in touch with his emotions. I think we, we were watching him and, and he was, it wasn't even so much what he was saying, but he was feeling everything. Um, and, and by the end of, of that improvisation, um, he had tears in his eyes and, and we were just blown away um, by, by what he could do. Um, and it was, it was amazing to see it because I think uh, if we had just let him go out of the room after, after doing the reading, uh, we would never have realized what he was capable of, but then either would he. So it was, yeah, it was really great to be able to, you know, watch that and, and watch him kind of nurture this incredible talent and then develop it, you know. The thing is, now watching it in Galway, it's probably one of the best performances I've ever seen as a young actor. Like, it was, and Leon, as well, yeah. Leon as well, you know. Um, but I think they're seen, both incredible. Oh, I, I just, and I'm not just saying that because, you know, you're obviously you're here, but it, it uh, really, I, I just, the rawness of it and the tears, like, and, and the script, like, it's not every actor, adult actor, young actor, it, it, he just blew me away, you know. And how old was he when he actually did? So he was, they were both 11. Um, I think Leon was a little bit older. He's a few months older than, than Eli. Um, but they were both 11. And, um, like, I really wanted to cast it as close to the age as we could. Um, because from, from all the interviews I've read, all the people I've... To talk to who have met these boys the, the one thing they all say is is how they, they were always taken aback by the smallness of them uh, when, when, when they, they'd meet them that they're just these two little 10 year old boys so uh, I wanted to cast it as close to the actual ages as we could um, like and their people, accents as well like the Liverpool accent it can be quite a tricky accent to do well, that's probably <laughs> the biggest criticism we get on the film you know but um, yeah I, I think you know, it's, it's, people in Liverpool are, are definitely, you know, going to say that's not a Liverpool accent. Um, what we tried to do was, um, like, the, the boys worked with the dialect coach and we would, um, he would, he would kind of talk to them about all the sounds of the Liverpool accent. Uh, like, there's a very strong TH sound, like, I think so, I think so. And, uh, uh, you know, instead of saying I know, it, it turns to I know, I don't know, I don't know. I'm not an expert on it, but I picked up these little things by kind of listening to it. So I think, you know, what we did was it's, um, it's more like a movie accent, right? Because it's also understandable for an international audience, like Americans will get it. But I think if it was a very strong Liverpool accent, um, they, they probably wouldn't, you know, hear everything, all the words. So um, we kind of purposely did set out to to you know obey the rules of the liverpool accent but also i think for the boys if, if they were you know trying to do something an accent which was so far away from their own accent um it, it would kind of throw them off a little bit like like the, the way um myself and the dialect coach you know kind of looked at it was that uh they you know take the instead of them thinking that they're doing a an, a different voice they sort of take the the accent and, and drop it into their own voice so it's, it's still them and it still should feel real and, and, and authentic, you know, but still, you know, obeying these certain rules of, 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 of the Liverpool accent. Well, for me anyway, it was spot on for an on a Liverpool accent. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, you're from Ireland. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you know, even like people in the UK and like mm -hmm. London have, 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 have said they, they didn't question it either, you know, so it depends how close you get to... <laughs> To Liverpool, but at the same time, I, I started looking at it as, as just a, a universal story. Um, 
you know, I, I know it is, you know, very strongly placed there in Liverpool, but I, I think it's, it's probably more important to, you know, that their performances felt real than, than nailing the accent. So, I, yeah, I always kind of felt, you know, as long as it feels authentic um, from a universal sense, um, that, that the film would work. And obviously, uh, we have to talk about the controversy. I, I know the film attracted a lot of controversy. Um, and did you expect it? Um, and did you find it difficult to deal with? Um, well, I, you know, I, I always knew th this was a film that, you know, people were going to have an opinion about. It's something that has always divided public opinion in the UK. And, um, and, and that's why it keeps coming back in the news. I mean, there's been several documentaries um, made about it with, with all the same information that, that's in detainment. And there's, this, there's been outrage over, over those as well. So I, I did expect, you know, there to be, um, you know, a, a divide in, in people's opinion on it. What I didn't expect though, was for people to just kind of start making things up about the film, which weren't true. I like nothing prepares you for that. <laughs> So I, my, my initial plan was, you know, that the film would screen on, on UK television. And we were actually very close to that happening. And I, I think, you know, once we had a, a date for a broadcast date, you know, I, I would have then liked to let the, the Bolger family know that this was coming up. Um, but then I, I, I wanted people to also you know, watch the film and, and then talk about the film. But then the, the Oscar nomination just kind of messed all of that up because the opposite was happening. People were talking about the film, but nobody had seen it. So because it's such a, a horrific case, I think, and so sensitive, people just naturally assumed that it was going to be a horrible film, that it was going to be made in supremely bad taste. So the tabloids, you know, started printing um, things to say basically that, that the, the, the film um, reenacts the murder and the torture inflicted on the boy, which, which obviously isn't true. Like everything in the film is entirely factual. Um, it's, it's almost entirely verbatim. And, and it's something that I was very careful about, like when we were making it to make sure everything in the film was, was true. So it, it was very hard to counteract it because people were hearing all of this misinformation. Uh, they're believing it and they, they were outraged by it. And, you know, without bothering to, to check it or, or look at the film, they, um, they, they just became outraged. And, and I understand it. I mean, I, I would be as well, I, I think, if, if I was reading that and believing it. Um, but it, then it caused a quarter of a million people to sign a, a petition to have the film banned and, and removed from the Oscars consideration. And I, I don't think any of them had seen the film. So that was a tricky one to, to counteract uh, because, because the film just wasn't available at the time either. And say if you weren't- Do you think, sorry, do you think that the um, UK tabloid media actually created the controversy? Well, I think they, they uh, certainly, you know, stirred it because, um, you know, I, I, of course I would have naturally expected them, you know, to report on it, um, but, I, I think they were reporting on it in a in a irresponsible way because they were saying certain things as as though it was fact and um, and for was that not deliberate though was that was that not deliberate you know to try and oh, amplify yeah, the I mean, outrage to create it's, a story it's like like you know we, we went back to them uh, my my publicist you know and said you know literally you know said well well you know this is wrong and this is wrong it doesn't reenact the murder or the torture. Or, or any of these things, the film is entirely factual. Uh, what you've written is is incorrect, you know. Um, but they they you know still would never change the story because um, it, it's not it's not going to sell papers for them to say that that we we got this wrong, you know. Um, so they they liked the story the way they had it because that's what the readers wanted to hear. So uh, the, the tabloids never changed their opinion, but the, the broadsheets eventually. Um, did start writing it and more nuanced articles and 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 did start you know talking about the film in a very positive way and saying that it's um, it, it's an important um, contribution to the discussion of of that case. So so there's been there's been lots of like really great you know articles like and from experts involved with the case as well. 
um, that have since come out. You know, um, it's it's been ignored by the tabloids, and I think there was there was a period there where they were just also um, even even the broadsheets were afraid to write anything positive about the film because they were just afraid that it could be construed as being unsympathetic to the Bulger family, I think. Did you have a, an interview with the Sunday Times at one stage? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, that was like right after the Good Morning Britain interview, which I think that was that was probably the you know the, the turning point and, and where everything suddenly just went crazy. Twitter was going crazy after after that interview. Um, and it was one, you know, I, 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 I nearly didn't do it because we, uh, we, uh, we'd already made the shortlist um, at, at that stage. But um, I, I, and I, I was sick as well at the time, you know, I, I was thinking I, I, I don't need to do it, you know. But um, anyway, um, I, we decided to do the interview and um, they, they had said, you know, that, oh, tell them not to worry. We're, we're just going to talk about the film. We won't be, you know, doing anything negative. And I, I didn't really believe it, but, and I was right not to believe it, you know. Um, so then, you know, Good Morning Britain, it's a controversial uh, morning show. So I was, you know, um, I, expecting, uh, you know, a, a little bit of, of um, a backlash from them, you know, but they, yeah, they really didn't give me an easy time on there. Um, but it was also, it was also hard to, to answer a question because they, they don't really, you know, like you to, to, to give an answer. Um, to the question, so um, I think it was it was after that interview and and the way it was handled that that made it you know hit the front page of um, tabloids and and really you know um, divided people's opinion on it. Then it's funny because there has been like documentaries or about the Bulger case and uh, and why do you think it was is it your your particular historic villain was targeted. Like why are why are dramas targeted more than documentaries? Um, well, I mean the documentaries, you know, were were slammed as well. There was like uh, Channel Five made made an excellent documentary actually, um, and it was it was only it was less than a year before Detainment came out, um, which was really great. I mean, looking at it from from all sides, you know, I mean, like Was Justice Done was the name of the documentary, and it looked at you know Was Justice Done for the family, like should they have gone on to serve time in an adult prison? They said, I mean, there's, there's an opinion that, that, um, that you know, they were treated too, too well. Um, and, and then it also looks at, you know, was, was justice done for the boys? And, you know, I, I felt it was very balanced, but it still got, you know, slammed by, by the Bulger family. And, you know, they, they felt it was um, being sympathetic to, to um, John Venables and Robert Thompson. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, you know, anything that, that shows a balanced point of view, um, it gets the same uh, criticism, like on this case. People, people don't like to look at it from any other way. Um, but I, I think there is more than one perspective on the case. Um, but people are, uh, they're used to only ever feeling one thing about something, I think, uh, and not two things. Like you're either for or against something. So when you ask people to feel two things, um, it, it gets you in trouble. <laughs> um, but sorry, your, your question was, you know, why this film, I, I think it was, it was probably a bit more personal because the, the, uh, the, the, the you know, the, the outrage was directed more at, at Channel 5 that time about that documentary, not, not at one person. But because I had made this film, I, it was self-funded. It was, it was me who, who was behind this film. It was all directed at me. I got hate threats or hate mail death threats, like so many of them, like just on a you know daily basis, um, to the point where you know I actually just got used to it. I, I started, I started categorizing them at first, like um, <laughs> in folders on on my email and and stuff, like, uh, and then I was like, I, I can't, I can't do this, right? So you know, it, it just it just kind of you know um, got, got a bit overwhelming. It must have been quite shocking at first, you know, because you're just a filmmaker, you know, well, not just, you're an Oscar-nominated yeah. filmmaker now, but it must be quite shocking to receive death threats and, like... Uh, yeah, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting that, you know, um, but, but most of them, it was, it was people, they, they, they thought I, that, that there was... They, I think they had a different film in their minds. Um, but, you know, understandably so, because they, they were reading 
um, an article which had all this misinformation. Um, so, so I, I don't necessarily even blame uh, those those people. You know, um, I think I'd probably feel the same way if if, if I was reading an article like that. And actually, did you have sorry? Did you have a um? It was it you mentioned before about an interview you did with the Sunday Times, and then then it oh, was all right. Yeah, so sorry, did I get sidetracked? I, I, yeah. yeah, so that was that, that was the day after the Good Morning Britain interview. My publicist, um, Catherine Lynn Scott from London Fair, Flair, Flair, she's a genius, worth her weight in gold. Um, she, she said, you know what, this is fine. I, I'm a journalist um, from the Times. She's going to come and talk to you. And she did. They brought a photographer. They talked to me for a good 90 minutes or something. Um, she said she'd seen the film. She said what's what's been reported about it uh, isn't true. She said she was going to give her you know her own opinion in the article, but she also wanted to talk to me. So I was really relieved, and and I didn't really mind what the tabloids were saying over the weekend because I felt like okay, there's this this article is coming out on Monday in the Times. So I I was like you know that's that's gonna you know be a louder voice than than all of all of these others. <laughs> And and then it wasn't in the paper on the Monday, and I was like, "What's going on, Catherine?" And and I I, I rang her, and, and she said, "Well, let me check." And they came back to say that she said um, they're they're burying it, that they're not running. I was like, "Well, are they going to run it next week?" And she said, "No, um, they it's it's buried because they they were afraid that um, it could be construed as 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 being unsympathetic." to the Bulger family, and they were terrified of getting a backlash against the paper. Um, and then after that, there was like another paper, we, we, we asked a film reviewer to, to do a review, and, uh, and he said he'd be happy to. You know, he, he wrote a, a really positive review, and the editor said, well, we can't publish that because it, it would be construed as being unsympathetic to, to the Bulger family. Um, and, and this is what we were hearing then from the broadsheets. And it, it was amazing to see that firsthand. It just gave me that sense of how enormously sensitive this case is when, you know, the broadsheets won't write a story they know to be true because they're afraid of getting a backlash from it. Um, I think that there's, there's this sense where the broadsheets also will always write something more nuanced about that case and, and do want people to look at it, you know, not just from one point of view, but, you know, as a tragedy for three families. And, 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 and they have. But also, you know, um, in, in this case, uh, I felt that, you know, if, if they don't stand up to, to what the tabloids are saying, you know, people's opinion will never change. So, um, you know, they, they, I, think, I think at that stage, I, 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 just, I just felt like uh, uh, there was nobody that, that, that could possibly, you know, save it if, if the broadsheets don't even do it. Um, they eventually did, you know, but it was, I think it took the New York Times. There was a New York Times article which came out and the headline was Why Britain is Outraged about an Oscar-nominated short film. And it ran in the New York Times, like with a picture of the thing, it was a big article. And it went into the whole controversy in the UK and why it's such a sensitive case and, and why they're afraid to report on it. And then, then after that, I, th I think that opened it up a lot and, and um, and the broadsheet started writing more nuanced articles and, and, and pointing out why this is an important film. Um, but the damage had already been done at that stage. And, and of course, the tabloids you know, would never change their opinion on it. Do you think it affected your chance of winning, winning the Oscar in the end? The yeah, yeah, it, it probably did. You know, uh, there was like a lot of Americans, um, you know, would have read The Guardian. That's, that's big in L.A. Um, it can get out there, and I think um, uh, w one of the things you know that, that they, they couldn't really um, get their head around was was the whole um, you know not asking for permission uh, and stuff like. So a lot of people think that you know, of course, I should have asked for permission because uh, of course it's such a sensitive subject, you know, and uh, and it's something I really thought about for a long time, um, and. Uh, you know, so I think I think for voters, um, some of them might have felt wrong, you know, voting for a film knowing that um, the family of the victim were against it. Um, and if there was any way around it, I, I would have 
I, I would have done it. You know, um, like, I, I think, you, you know, the, the Bulger family, um, you know, absolutely, you know, you couldn't expect them to have an ounce of sympathy for those boys. Um, you know, I, I'm so, I've, I've always felt nothing but sympathy for, for the Bulger family. And, um, uh, you know, it, it breaks my heart to think of the, the experience that they've gone through and, and had to go through. So I think if it happened to me, if it happened to you, you would feel exactly the same way, you know, and, and of course you wouldn't want a film made which, which humanizes these boys, you know. Um, it shows them, you know, not as monsters, but as they were, as, as two 10-year-old boys who have committed, you know, an act of unimaginable horror. Um, and, I mean, I, I started to see, you know, that, that there's, 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 there's more than one perspective on the case, and, and I think, I think if, if we had gone and asked for permission, um, it most certainly would have been a no, you know. Um, but but even if if they did give permission, I think there would have been enormous pressure to tell the story uh, the way they wanted it to be told, and and then you're still just looking at the case from one perspective, and and I think it would have defeated the whole purpose of the film because it was meant to be an unbiased account. It's, it's, it's based on the interview transcripts. Uh, it's entirely factual um, and it's, it's verbatim. So, so uh, in order to tell it in an impartial way, uh, we decided that the only way to do it was, you know, not to consult with any of the families involved and um, to rely solely on, on the interview transcripts. Do you think so, you'll ever return to the story? Do you think, is, is this it for the Pulitzer story for you? Or do you think- I think, I think I'm done with it. Uh, after, yeah, after, after the, the backlash I've got. Um, I, I do think there's a wider story there. And um, I, 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 I would like if somebody went, came back to it and explored it. I, I, I don't think it'll be me, um, but but, but there, there is, you know, a, a fascinating story there, even in the lead up to um, how the detectives, you know, caught the boys and, and everything that happened before and after the interviews and, and the trial as, as well. Um, it's, it's, it's a really, it's a fascinating story and, and one that I think still haunts people. So we have to ask you something really important, the Oscars. So any juicy gossip you can give us, sir? Because it's uh, an amazing, amazing um, experience. Okay. Like to see, to have to meet you in Galway and then see the journey you right. went, and then be nominated for an Oscar it must have been an amazing experience. So from the time you landed in LA, you know, how, how did that week go for you? Yeah, um, like yeah, it was it was all a bit surreal, really. Um, but it was it was coming like at the height of the controversy as well. So. Um, I, I, it was very hard to, you know, enjoy what was happening. Like it was, it was, it was more just kind of, you know, dealing with 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 everything going on. Um, but it it was a, it's just a very um, surreal sort of experience. Like uh, one of the first events I think was the this, the nominees luncheon that you attend. Um, I didn't really know what this was before. Um, I thought it was just like lunch or, or something. Uh, we were supposed to be in Clermont Ferrand for the festival when that was on, and and my publicist said, "Oh no, you have to be at the luncheon." I was like, "Yeah," and um, so we went to the luncheon, and it was it was amazing because it was like for one day, um, uh, all the nominees are there in a room, um, and you're you're just treated like an equal. Um, you can go up and talk to anybody. Um, so, you know, I, I was talking to Bradley Cooper, Rami Malek, Lady Gaga, and they're all happy to talk to you. I, I was sharing with Spike Lee. I don't mean to be name dropping, but it was just... That's what uh, we want. It was unusual, you know, <laughs> to be uh, around that and, and to be able to just say, oh, hey, Bradley, how are you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and it's, it's also, that's the day where they do the, the class photo where um, they call the nominees' names one by one and you come up and and join, you know, this this photo um, uh, of all the nominees. So, so yeah, that was a very surreal experience. Like to hear names like Christian Bale and and then Vincent Lam. I was like, what's <laughs> going on? Like so, yeah, it was it was just very strange, you know. Um, but I think that day was almost better than the Oscars because I, I I was just you know we were very relaxed and everything that day. 
and it was it was just so unexpected <laughs> um, to be around, all, you know, all the all the nominees. And it was just amazing because you got to bring uh, Leon and Eli and, and their families, I presume, as well to go. Yeah, to yeah, they 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 came with their parents and um, uh, yeah, and we'd um, like some of the like uh, the cast and crew were there as well. But we had the boys like Eli and Leon uh, were on the red carpet with us, and they were in the nominees section um, for the Oscars. So yeah, it was it was a really bizarre experience. Like standing on on the red carpet, it, it's something that I used to always watch growing up um, as a kid. I, I'd always stay up and watch the Oscars live, or um, well, well, a version of, I'd hear them because we we had Sky Movies scrambled at the time, which meant you know you can't see the picture because <laughs> we didn't subscribe to it. But uh, um, you, you, the colors would kind of light up the room, and I'd imagine what it would be like to, to, to be there. So like to, to finally be standing on the red carpet and to be able to reach out and, and, and touch everything was, was just such a um, strange experience, you know? So like, I, I, we were kind of on the red carpet looking at the boys and we're like, is this really happening? You know, um, it, was, it was crazy, but, but also great for, great for them, you know? And because um, I, was, I was always imagining what it'd be like to do it at that age. Um, you know, they were first, like imagine first, when they're older. Oh, I was at the Oscars. Like imagine going back to school. You know. Yeah, yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah, for anyone. But I think it was like on the day when it was happening. Yeah, it was. It was hard to know if it was real. It was maybe months later, like three months later. We were kind of looking back and, and thinking, "Oh my God, we we did that. We were we were there. We were we were at the Oscars." Any goodie bags? Uh, any trips to the Bahamas? Rolex watches? I, I did not get any hoodie <laughs> bags or Rolex watches or no, um, no, they do like there's, yeah, there's this kind of myth about the swag bag thing, but I, I think it's just for, for actors, like the best actor and best actress categories and oh, and supporting actor and actress. So the idea with that is that they, you know, they want famous people to be wearing um, Gucci watches or, or, or something like that. And it's, it's, it promotes the brand and everything. I, I don't think um, live action shorts are high on their priority list. <laughs> you did some TV over there as well, did you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did a bit of TV. Like, um, yeah, I mean, it was very different to the TV I'd been doing in the UK. Um, there was, you know, and, and even my publicist, Catherine said, oh, you know, don't, don't worry about the masking any, thing remotely controversial here. <laughs> um, it was all just stuff like, um, oh, like, so what are you gonna do if you win the Oscar? Okay. And, and I was like, um, I, I don't know, you know? And, and it was um, all questions like where, I, I was, I was kind of thinking, yeah, they really don't understand how sensitive this, this case is. <laughs> how did they actually uh, receive, how did the film receive that over there? Um, I, I think, yeah, I, th I think people, um, a lot of people wouldn't have heard of the case, you know, um, surprisingly, you know, outside of Ireland and the UK, there's, there's a huge amount of people that, that just don't know it. Um, but, you know, it was, it was nice to know that, that it still worked as a universal story and, and, you know, everyone I had talked to, you know, said they, that they were still affected by the film. Um, on, on, you know, on, on an emotional level, and they were also interested in the story. So, so it was, it was nice that it, it kind of also acted as a bit of a gateway, um, it, which allowed other people to do their own research into the case. And, you know, the film, it doesn't have all the answers and it purposely, it doesn't, you know, uh, I, I've, I've never, you know, said that it does, you know, but the, the idea is that it's, it asks the right questions and, and lets people, um, you know, look at it um, and for themselves. So are you a member of the Academy now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was when it was that, it was like, I, I think when, when you get nominated for an Oscar, you just kind of get automatically considered for membership. So, so yeah, now I'm a member of the Academy and I, um, I, I got to vote on the Oscars, uh, the, the last ones there. And, um, it was, yeah, interesting. So I, I vote on the long list for the live action shorts and then the nominations for every other category. So it was, yeah, re really interesting. Yeah, I, I keep getting sent these, um, these screeners 
and they're, they're like, they're here. So, right, so they, they send me all these screeners. So every time Oscar season comes around, I, I always have something to watch. Oh my and God. It's great. <laughs> it's great I, I, I job, isn't it? These, just kind of sitting there. And um, yeah, it's, it, it, it gives me something to do. So I'm looking forward to that <laughs> again. <laughs> Um, but also, you know, great to kind of see how it works um, as a voter from the other way around, because it was something I was always wondering about, like how, how do voters think? And um, if, I was, if I was doing it again now, I, I would, uh, I, I'd know a lot more about, about how to, about how to um, um, market it, you know, for voters. Are you a lifetime member now? Is it a lifetime oh, or is it yearly? Yeah, I, I think it's for life. I, I think there might be some kind of rule, like if, if you don't make a film in 10 years or something like that, if you don't have a credit, um, you can lose it. But I, it's pretty much for life, um, uh, as is, that's what they said, you know. So, um, so yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's a really enormous honour, um, I have to say, you know. How many people are in the Academy, do you know? I'm not sure right now because it, it keeps going up, but I, it's, I think it's somewhere in the region of 10,000. It's probably a bit more now, like as they, they're taking on, um, you know, I think it's around 800 people or something a, a year now um, for the last few years. Whereas previously it used to be very small intake that they would do. Um, but I, I think they're trying to, um, you know, uh, weed out like you know particular tastes. You know that that might have you know been attributed to the academy previously. So, so you know every year they you know they they look for quality and diversity with with the new members that they what they take in, which which is great. You know, you mentioned working with a publicist. How important was it to work with your publicist? How's that come about? Um, you yeah, to... Catherine Lynn Scott was my publicist from London Flair PR. And she is just a genius. Um, I, I honestly, you know, can't speak highly enough of her and, and, and how she does it. And um, it was, she contacted me um, initially. She heard about the film. I think it was the Young Director Award in Cannes that it had just won. And she, she said, oh, I'd love to work on your film and, and everything. I didn't even know what a publicist was or, or, or what they would do so she kind of explained a bit about it to me she said you know if you qualify for an oscar um well first of all they can do press around an oscar qualifying festival um but then once you qualify for academy award consideration um the idea is that you know she kind of pushes your film and promotes it to academy voters and and make sure they, they hear about it and so i think a big part of, of, of why you need a, a publicist is because as a voter, um, not all the voters have to watch everything that's on the long list. Uh, there's a lot of films, like there was, I think there was 191 films the last time. Um, in, in my year, there was 141, you know. So um, they, they, the Academy, they only have to watch, you, you get divided into different groups, voters do. And you've got to watch, I think, 25%, which is your quota that you have to watch. And you can also watch anything outside of that. Uh, but the thing is, you want the, the, the voters to watch your film, even if it's not in their quota. And that's how you'll, you make the shortlist, because it's so hard to make the shortlist of 10 films. Um, you mark, everything gets marked from six to 10 or something. So, you know, it, in order to make the shortlist of 10, it's got to get a, a very high nine point something <laughs> to be there uh, more than likely. So, so anyway, after Catherine had, had called me, um, I, I just, I knew I couldn't afford it. I, I asked her what her rates were and I was like, I, I can't afford that. I was like, don't call me. I will call you if, if I need you. And I, I kind of um, hung up the phone and forgot about it. Hadn't planned on coming back to it until we suddenly won an Oscar qualifier then. It was, it was in Denmark in Odense. And um, there was only, it was only like three weeks, I think, before the deadline to submit. And I, I started panicking. So I, I was like, all right, I think we need a publicist. I rang Catherine back and I said, would you be interested in detainment? And she said, 
uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd, I'd love to work on it. She said because she didn't have anything like that on her list. So she took it on. I think, I think like as an eleventh film or something that year. Um, like she likes to work to about ten films, and I was, I was so delighted when, when she took it on, um, because her, her, their track record of, of Oscar shorts is astounding. You know, uh, so that year of detainment. I think of the, the, the short list of 10 films, five of them came from Catherine. Um, half the short list came from one person, <laughs> one person in the UK. People, filmmakers from all around the world uh, look for this person <laughs> and because they think she might be the secret ingredient. So she got five on the short list and four of the five nominees um, were from, from Catherine Lynn Scott with London Flair, Piora as well. So, Phenomenal, and, and she had done the same thing the year before. She had half the short list, um, three were nominated, and she had the winner, The Silent Child. So, um, yeah, they, they know what they're doing, and, and it was really great to, to be working with them. Was there um, an interview you did with Sky that was kind of pivotal? That was well, yeah, that was, um, that was one of the, probably one of the turning points, I think. Um, and that was before the, the controversy had even started like uh sky news asked to interview me and uh they did it i have to say in in such a responsible way you know um because they they weren't taking sides about the interview and they weren't you know trying to uh, force an opinion on people that all came later um the sky news interview it was uh it was with gamal and and the way he introduced the film kind of took my breath away as he said, um, we were long listed at this stage, so there was still 141 films in consideration. But he said, uh, he introduced it as a new film about the James Bulger case, which is tipped for an Oscar. Mm -hmm. and, and once they used the word tipped for an Oscar, I was like, are we tipped for an Oscar? And, and Catherine said to me, he said, well, you are now because Sky News just said it. <laughs> so amazingly, you know, kind of by saying it, um, it, it comes true, it, it, it became true. So that was like um, one of the, the genius things uh, a publicist can do, I have to say. Um, and then people started hearing about the film and it kept being mentioned in the same sentences as Oscars or the same paragraph. And, and that's kind of how London Flair work, I think, is to take your film and, and get it mentioned as often as possible um, in, in the same sentence as, as Oscars and Academy Awards. And, um, and that's, that's what they did. That's, kind of, that's how they did it. And, and they did it. And like marketing is so important, you know, like how you might have an amazing film, but if you don't have the right log line or synopsis, how will people, you know, right. like, like, be interested? Yeah. How do you find that with like getting people like originally? That's something I kind of noticed, like we, we decided to change the logline, we tweaked it a little bit for Academy voters because all, all you can, um, all you're allowed to see on the film is the, the logo of the film, um, the duration and uh, the logline, that's it. So like you can, you can use a different logo, like you can have that or whatever, you can show the logos, right? But um, uh, you can't you can't show any other pictures beyond that. I mean, that's why they get a bit creative with <laughs> these things. But you can't have any pictures. You can't have any festival laurels. Um, uh, no quotes from journalists or anything that is going to uh, try and sway a voter's opinion. So, so that's why the logline really needs to be so important. And I would even say to people, you know, even if um, if it means giving away a little bit of the plot of your film, if you're if you're pushing it. For, with Academy voters, um, you need to have a logline that is going to make them watch it, you know, that's going to engage them, you know, so there's, um, you know, certain films like that, it might mean giving away a little bit of the twist, um, but at least your film will be watched. Um, it's funny because myself and Cahal had us recently re reviewing a, a short film that was nominated for an Oscar for no budget called Miller's and Son. And oh yeah, I know Miller. Yeah, that's one of the ones I, I loved oh, that. It? Yeah, it was great. Yeah. But it's funny because um, Carl said to me, Claire and Milo, don't read the synopsis, whatever you do, before you watch the film. So I okay. so, uh, so I watched the film and it was brilliant. Like, but but it's, it's funny because I read the synopsis and I was so glad Carl said that to me because it gave away it, the whole twist. 
But after uh, you tell well, me about the log lines and getting attention from the Oscars, I see why they're do they've done that, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I can understand because it's got the LGBT theme and, and if you don't, um, if that wasn't included, you might miss those voters that are, are really going to connect with, with that, with, with the LGBT theme. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably a, a, a really good example um, of, of why you should rethink it. So what, what we added in, like um, my publicist said to me, you know, maybe we should put something in to, you know, let voters know that this is still something that um, causes outrage today in the UK. And this is, this is long before there's any outrage because <laughs> we're only a few months into the festival run at this stage. So when we were submitting it, um, it was only a couple of months in, um, uh, you know, I, we hadn't anticipated that there was going to be so much um, outrage, you know, specifically about the film. But uh, what we changed in the logline, I think we added in a little bit at the end. So we had, it was uh, two 10 year old boys are detained by police under suspicion of abducting and murdering a toddler. A true story based on interview transcripts um, of the James Bulger case, uh, which shocked the world in 1993. So, and then we added a little extra bit <laughs> to that. We said a true story, uh, which uh, shocked the world in 1993 and continues to incite public outrage throughout the United Kingdom. And um, by, by adding that, I think it really helped um, put things in perspective when people were hearing uh, about all this outrage and the controversy, they, they were kind of able to, to deal with it a little bit better there were, because it, it looked like it, it, you know, it wasn't just coming out of nowhere. Um, they, they knew that this, was, this is just a case that divides opinion. Um, and it was important to get in there. I'm, I'm so glad we had it there. Um, you, and, you think that the, the Academy is, is attracted by a certain type of film? Uh, yeah, I, this is something I talked to Catherine and Scott about because I, somehow she has short films nominated every year for Oscars and all you have to do is look at their website to see their track record. <laughs> I think it's like the last eight years in a row she's had short films uh, nominated for Oscars, either winning Oscars or, or nominated. And she, she only chooses like about maybe 10 films roughly she likes to work on and I've heard of films that she's also said that you know from filmmakers that have come to me and, and said they've asked her to work on the film and she'd say no um, so she does have a very specific criteria in in what she looks for in a film and uh, it, it's a good one because I've started to see it now as well so she said it's, it's usually a longer short that that will do well with Academy voters um, it's, it's, it's highly unlikely that a five minute short is going to, um, you know, get nominated for an Oscar. That's quite interesting because normally in film festivals, um, they always say, oh, make them short. Like, yeah. Don't go over, yeah. Won't go over 20 minutes because they'll never um, watch it. And, you know. And it's no, I mean, that's something I would always say to people as well. Like if you're making a short film, make it short. But I, I went against my own advice and I went and made a 30 minute film. Um, so, yeah, it is like, and the thing is, when you make a 30 minute film, you got to kind of know what you're getting into, because there's a lot of festivals it's just not going to be right for. They won't be able to program it because it means saying no to six, five minute films. So, you know, lots of festivals couldn't program it, but the, the ones that did really, really liked the film and connected with it. So you got to take all of that into consideration as well. Um, and, and decide what you're aiming for. But, but for the Oscars, um, it, it helps to have a longer film because it allows you to do more. You can get um, an, like a, an emotional depth in, in, a, in a short that, that is, is longer. So, you know, I, I think maybe the ideal length for a film is, you know, maybe 15, 20, 20 minutes maybe is a good middle ground where it'll still work for festivals and, and the Oscars. Um, so, I mean, that, that's one of the things, and, 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 and not the length for the sake of the length. If it, if it doesn't warrant the length, then there's no point making it longer. Um, it should only be long if, if, if it deserves to be that long. You know, it should still be a concise film, I think. Um, but it, there should be an emotional depth to it. Um, 
I, I think the film, you know, it, it needs to be about something like whether it's it's a you know a cause-based issue like or um, an LGBT issue or or a true story or, or factual. If if there's something there that gives it a little bit of depth, I think that is also something that connects with voters. Um, I know me personally, like if if something is a true story. I'll, I'll always just give it a little bit more of my attention than than something that's just factual. Um, something else like that, uh, my publicist said to me was um, that they they love child actors. She said she said you know if if you've got child actors that give performances that ring true, um, she said the academy are just suckers for it. <laughs> so I think I started to see why she she really wanted entertainment so much. Um, at the same time, you know, you can have all the right ingredients, um, but it's still incredibly hard to make the short list of 10 films. So it's, it's, it's just extremely difficult to get there, you know, and for so many reasons, sometimes because your film can just be overlooked, um, but also because there's a lot of good films um, and you don't know what's necessarily going to connect with voters. Sorry, the guy yeah. that won this year, did he not have... Um... Was that oh, yeah, third or that's right. Um, no, I met for the major window. Yeah, I, I met the director mm. and he, um, he's been nominated four times, um, if you can believe it. And that's, that's not an accident, you know, <laughs> um, that's, that's recognizing um, uh, what, what the Academy vote for, what they look for and, and, and how to do it. So there's, 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 there's planning there as well, you know, but um, I think, you know, after doing it now, I've, I've kind of, I mean, maybe I'm just getting cocky, but it, it, it definitely seems easier um, when, when you see what they vote for and how they vote. And, and, and just after watching everything that was on the long list um, and, and the ones that, that made it, I think I made a, I made a list of, of around 18 films or something. And I, I, I figured the short list was going to come from within those films that I made and I was amazed to see how right I was you know I was wrong about uh, two of them but it was it was actually um one of them I, I actually just hadn't seen um so yeah it's you can kind of uh, you know narrow it down but I, I I just think it's such a fabulous achievement you know and it was so lovely to meet you and then seeing the journey you went on you know and and uh, and right. for everyone involved in the piece as well the producers the actors everyone behind the scenes so if there's one piece of advice for no budget viewers, people are starting off, you know, maybe early in their filmmaking careers, what would it be? Um, right, I, I would say um, aim high, <laughs> I think, and, and don't ever compromise because, uh, I mean, that, that was something, you know, like with detainment, I think one of the trickiest questions people ask is, did I ever imagine um, that, you know, I would be here at the Oscars, you know, and of course you can't say yes, because then you just sound arrogant, you know, but at the same time, um, you know, when, when I was making the film, uh, you know, nobody sets out to make a mediocre film. I, I did want to make the best film I, I could make. And, and your ultimate goal there then is, you know, is to win an Oscar. So, so I have to say, you know, I, I, I did aim to win an Oscar. I didn't, but I, I came that close, you know, so, it still absolutely took my breath away to see how close we got. Um, and, 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 and that was amazing. But I, I, I also, you know, can't say either that, that it, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, on the radar whatsoever. Like it, it was always right down to everything, like down to the composer you choose, the sound designer you get, everything, the grade, everything um, needs to be at a certain standard. And, and if you've got like one bad note somewhere, uh, that could be what, what lets your film drop down. So that's what I mean by don't, don't compromise. Um, and, and aim high, because if you're just aiming to get your film into, you know, into that festival, um, I, I don't think that's good enough. Because you know, even if you don't quite make it, if you, don't, if, if you don't get to what you're aiming for, you'll still end up somewhere good, I think. So. So yeah, that, that would be my advice, even though it's hard, you know, and, and you might be working on a budget. Um, I, I think there's a way of doing it. Like detainment was still self-funded. It took me longer to make it, um, probably because I didn't have all the money to finish it the way I wanted to finish it at the time. 
uh, but you know, I had time, so so I used it. And that was six years in the making altogether, was it? Well, no, I mean, I think the idea was knocking around my brain for, for that time before the film had, had been made. I wasn't even sure if I was going to make it um, first. I, I was, I remember always thinking that it would be a, a brilliant drama, you know, but, but also that it was something people weren't really aware of. Um, and, and I wanted to make something that could be educational um, as, as well as, as um, I, I don't think entertaining is the right word, you know, but as, as well as, you know, um, a, a film, something that, that people can, can sit down and, and, and still be affected by. Um, and, and, and I think that's what, what was different about making a, a drama as opposed to making a documentary. Like the, the story had been told so many ways as a documentary um, with the same information that's in detainment. We, we've seen it lots of times, but, but what a drama can do that a documentary can't do is that it, 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 lets, uh, it lets you put the viewer in the room. It lets, it, and it lets them kind of feel every moment, every feeling as if it's their own. Whereas I think with a, with a documentary, uh, you know, you're, you're getting that information through interviews or second hand, but you're not emotionally connected to, to what's happening. Um, and, and that's also um, part of the reason people, I think, have, a, have an issue with detainment because they're, they're feeling something when they're in the room there with John. And, and I think just human beings are naturally conditioned to, to feel something. If they see a 10 year old boy crying, they're, they're going to feel something. But if that boy happens to be John Venables, um, if that's somebody that you've always been told to hate, someone that's evil, then you start to question, um, you know, is this propaganda or something? Or is this, you know, am I being manipulated or, or something? And I think that's what, what just didn't sit right with a lot of people. Um, but I, I promise you, everything in the film is entirely factual. Um, John, John cried his eyes out uh, for the whole interview process. And, and to show it any other way, uh, just wouldn't be a, a true reflection of what happened. Did you think, did you, at any point, uh, did you worry that you weren't going to get the right actors? Um, no, I, 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 I always knew we, we would get the actor because I'd worked with child actors um, before. I, I knew they were capable of doing so much more than, than the stuff that was being written for them. Um, my producer, it was the, probably the first thing he said after he read it. He said, well, that's great, but you're never going to get two kids mm -hmm. to, to be able to play that convincingly. And, and I said, well, that's one of the reasons I want to make it. Because I said, I, I know we can. I, I know, and and I, I was even finding it hard to compare it to another film. You know, I mean, I had these incredible performances in my head that, that these child actors could do it. Um, so in one way, it, it, was, it, was, it, it, was, it was great to be able to do that and to find two boys and, and allow them just reach their potential um, as, as actors. So it was, it was a great project to work on with Eli and Leon and we'd catch up like every weekend and kind of workshop these scenes. Um, so it was, it was really great to, to, you know, to, to have the time and to do that with them. And, and I really missed it actually afterwards. At, at the end of the shoot, I was kind of like, oh, what am I gonna do now with my weekends? And, uh, and I just, I missed the boys and the whole process of doing it, you know, but, but then you know, we got to catch up at film festivals and everything uh, once the, the, the film was made. So, so so yeah so we're still in touch now you know and and it's yeah you know it's it's, it's nice to to still be in touch with them so what, what are you working on now uh well there's so there's a thing i'm i'm working on this week a script that i've got to submit <laughs> very soon it's overdue um so i'm hoping to get that in tomorrow um myself and and our writer are working on this um, with the producer, I, I can't tell you too much about it, or I'll, I'll just kind of <laughs> jinx it. <laughs> like, we'll keep an eye out for it in the future, and we like, oh, uh, yeah, go. yeah. There's a lot of projects now that are just kind of gone on hold, um, especially in LA because with with COVID and everything. They, I mean, they tried to reopen, and um, the cases came back by eighty percent there, so they had to go right back into full lockdown. Crazy. So it's just put everything. Um, 
back further on hold now and uh well yeah there's there's still lots of you know um, projects that I'm, I'm interested in over there there's one that i'm attached to uh which is just a beautiful script um yeah yeah so if if if, if that comes back around and 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 if the funding comes into place for it at some stage that would be great but you know everything is just much more complicated now with with covid19 and everything. is it a feature or a short it's a feature yeah it's it's a drama and you know even at the best of times it's quite hard to get dramas made in la but uh it's it's lovely it's a, it's a kind of it's a contemporary drama and uh, um it's it's about um uh well uh, no, i better, sure I better. Say. <laughs> Don't worry, anyway, we'll try out for a drama. I'll only start rambling <laughs> on and they'll be like, oh, no, I've said too much about this. But no, it is great. And we'll see if, if something happens with it. But, you know, uh, right now, um, I, I, it's, it's not the time. Everything's just kind of on hold. Um, and, you know, this pandemic is bad timing for everybody. So Crazy. It's so we'll what happens, though. I just want to say a huge thank you to our lovely guest, your Oscar nominated writer director of Vincent Lam. And I've heard you just been nominated for an IFTA as well. So congratulations. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for chatting. It was lovely talking to yeah, both and of it was, you. It was so lovely to, to see you meet you in Galway and go on this massive journey. And, and to be Oscar nominated is, is just phenomenal. And I'd like to thank my lovely co host, Carl Feeney. So tune in again for another episode of No Budget. Thank you very much and good night. Good night. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye.